Today I want to take a closer look at communion. You know, in all my years of pastoring, I never had a whole sermon just on communion. So this is a first. I didn't pull it out of my archives or anything like that. You are my guinea pigs on this one. All right. Communion. Very interesting word. Communion. Where does this word come from that we're using? Well, I don't know where it really came from, but I do know this. My very first experience with communion that I can recall, I think I was seven years old. I probably saw it before then, but, it, you know, when you're that young, what do you remember, right? And so I remember, how many of you the time before plastic? You know, back before they used plastic cups. What did they do? They used glass cups, right? And then the, the deacons, not only did they have to fill them, and, and then they had to afterward collect them all, then they had to wash them all, dry them out, get them ready for the next service. Well, there I was, seven years old, this thing going on called communion. And they have these little, tiny, cute, little shot cups. <laughs> they are, they're miniature shot cups. That's what they are. They're glass. And everybody gets one, but my folks won't let me because I'm too young. I don't know what I'm doing. And so they don't let me. And so as they go by, no, nope, I can't take one. But when they're done, they, they put that communion cup in the rack. Now, you'll notice we got communion cup racks out there. You, you put the empties in there. And, and so they, when they put it there, I, I am just mesmerized by this gold. I mean, this, this, this glass, this little glass shot cup. And covetousness entered my heart. I wanted that cup. So when no one was looking, that cup <laughs> made its way into my pocket. Now, on the way home, my pocket starts kind of burning. Like, what am I going to do with it once I get home? Am I going to put it on my dresser? And my mom will say, where in the world did this come from? Then I got to confess, I stole the Lord's cup. <laughs> so I did what every seven-year-old kid would do. Everybody go into the house ahead of me. I think I'm not connected right here somehow. Hopping. Um, I did what every seven-year-old kid would do. I let the whole family go into the house first. I went in last. I went in the side door. We all went in the side door. You hit the landing, three steps up, or if you go straight down to the basement. I turned uh, three steps up, right inside the, the kitchen, there was the junk drawer. <laughs> Everyone has a junk drawer in the kitchen. You know, you, you got all kinds of odds and ends in there. We, we have a tape measure in there. I got, I got screwdrivers in there. Now, what do you use a screwdriver for in the kitchen? Come on now. But it's the dr junk drawer, and so... I am sure nobody is looking. I take that cup out of my pocket, pull that junk drawer open and drop it in. Because all of a sudden, I don't want to show off what I stole. I want to hide what I stole. I'm kind of like Adam and Eve in the garden after they'd sinned. They're trying to cover up because the voice of the Lord is coming through the garden. And there I was, seven years old. I had guilt. I knew that I'd done something wrong. And it was just, it was just eating me up inside. It's like my pocket was on fire. Get rid of it. Except, there's always that exception. I think my mom has eyes on the back of her head. <laughs> she waited a few minutes, just waited a few minutes. And then she thought of something that she needed out of the junk drawer. <laughs> and she said, Dennis, would you go to the junk drawer and get me? I forgot what it was, but... And then she's kind of looking over my shoulder as I open the drawer. I mean, my heart's pounding, I'm racing. I mean, I'm as guilty as can be, right? And there is that cup that I just dropped in, not even five minutes ago. And she said, oh, Dennis, what is this? <laughs> oh, my goodness. And there I am, bawling and crying that I had stolen the cup of the Lord. <laughs> and uh, so, yes, yeah, you understand why I have, I've spent a long time waiting to preach on communion. <laughs> <laughs> communion, communion. The word communion, the word communion, it comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16 in the King James. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? And the bread which we break, is it not the 
communion of the body of Christ. The Greek word there is koinonia, most often translated fellowship. It means an association. It means a close relationship. It is communion. And so when we participate in the Lord's Supper, the goal is for us to develop a close relationship with the Lord and with one another. That's the goal. That's communion. That's communion. Now, another term is used for communion. You hear this often. It's the Holy Eucharist. And so where does this term come from? Well, lo and behold, it comes right out of Matthew and 1 Corinthians because it said, Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed, when he had given thanks, Oh, there it is, the word given thanks in Greek is eucharistasis, eucharistasis. And so we just drop off the stasis on the end, it's eucharist, and, and actually you're speaking Greek every time you say that word. It's the eucharist, it's giving thanks, giving thanks. And that's what we do at every Lord's Supper, communion time. Uh, we give thanks and, and we have the Lord's Supper, and we should go from this place feeling like I am so connected to the Lord and to the other believers here because they're all connected too. That's what communion is all about. Those things. Now it's also called the Lord's Supper. It's called the Lord's Supper. In fact, in the passage we're going to look at in a few moments, it says, the Lord's Supper you eat. <laughs> All right, and so it is designed here that we're going to partake of the bread and the, and the cup. But we're having a supper meal, and we know that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who instituted it, and so we call it the Lord's Supper. Wow, we got all these terms for what we're doing here today. I want to dive into the text, and my first thing I want you to see here is look here. Now, that's like, like look here, I got something good for you. It's, actually, it's like, now look here, buddy. You know when you do that? Now look here, it's, it, it's that emphasis. You've messed up. Look here. And, and that's the way Paul's instruction on communion, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, that's the way it's done. <coughs> and the following directives I'm about to give, I have no praise for you. You're in big trouble. There I am standing with the, <laughs> the communion cup. <laughs> I am in big trouble. That's the way this communion passage starts off. For your meetings do more harm than good. Oh my goodness, listen. When they get together to celebrate the Lord's Supper, he's saying it does more damage than good. What a way to start off. Well, it's kind of like me. There I was, coveting <laughs> rather than confessing, right? And that's exactly what's going on here. The church has got a problem. So he begins by saying, now look here. There are divisions among you. He says, in the first place, let me start with this, he says. I hear that when you come together as a church, you've assembled together, that there are divisions among you. The church is divided. I have dealt with the divided church, it seems like, my whole life. It is called worship wars. <laughs> we got the group that likes the old hymns, and then we got the group that likes new contemporary music, and the two kind of beat it out. <laughs> And you try to get this thing solved. You got those that, you know, they want just a contemporary, and, and they say, man, we just love this music. And the older people are saying, I call that a 7-Eleven song. Seven words, you sing them 11 times, and you think that's, that's pleasing to God. <laughs> and the young people say, listen, we listen to your music. It's all that Jurassic Park stuff. It's, it was there with the dinosaurs were here. <laughs> and you have this conflict that's going on. You say, listen. There is divisions among you. And if I, as I have, I've read the book of 1 Corinthians, I know there's divisions in the church. That is a church with huge mega problems. And one of the big mega problems is over baptism, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. He says there's divisions among you, and he says to some extent I believe it. He says, well, no doubt there have to be differences among you. Well, listen, we're the body of Christ. Everybody can't be the hand. Everybody can't be the foot. Everybody can't be, and you just pick whatever part. You, everybody can't, or you have no body. So there's got to be differences, and that will show which ones of you are approved. There's got to be someone in your congregation who can be the pastor, someone to be deacons. You got to have somebody to work in the toddler's room. You got to have these people. 
There's got to be differences. Now, I know somewhere I am clicking this and messing this up. It happens every now and then. All right. He says, you've got to have these differences, but even though you have differences, you see, in the church today, we have believers who are Republicans dyed in the wool, far right wing. We've got those who are Democrats who are far left wing. But when you come to the church, there is no such thing as a Democrat or Republican Christian. Amen. When you come to church, we're all just Christians. That's it. That's it. Now, we might view everything a lot differently when it comes to politics, but when it comes time for the Lord's Supper, I've got to throw all that junk out the window because we are the body of Christ. Wow. All right, let's, let's move on. Here's the, big, the second big problem. They've got divisions. But they had agape feasts associated with the Lord's Supper. All right, so you notice up there some kind of weird, strange person <laughs> brought to our agape feast, a feast. They brought St. Peter's took a denial, and all of you knew immediately <laughs> that that was just nothing more than Kentucky Fried Chicken with been relabeled. I wonder who could have brought that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what? I brought, I brought, let me see, 48 pieces of chicken for 93 people. How was that going to work out? That meant not everybody's going to get a piece of chicken. How many got a piece of chicken? How many didn't get a piece of chicken? How many didn't go? <laughs> All, right. All right. So, I didn't invent the agape feast. The agape feast were the early Christians. We know that from, uh, it tells us, when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. Jude says, these men are blemishes at your love feast. Okay, so they had these love feasts, agape feast, agape meal. It just means a love meal. It's a love meal. And it's based upon what Jesus said in the upper room. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. Everyone will know you're my disciple by your love for one another. And so in the upper room, they had the original Passover, but Passover was a meal you only celebrated once a year, and they celebrated the Lord's Supper almost daily at first, and then weekly, and we do it once a month. And with it, they would have a meal, and they called it a love meal, a love feast. But something had gone wrong with the love feast. It says, for as you eat, each of you goes ahead of one another uh, without waiting for anyone else. They're line jumpers. <laughs> I saw that at the agape feast. You know why? Because I was holding back to the end. I, wanted to, I was watching. I was watching. <laughs> and who was jumping in for seconds before the, everybody got there first? I'm not going to name any names, okay. <laughs> he said, while you're having your agape feast, one goes ahead of the other. You're not waiting for anybody else, man. You, you're going in and you're, you're, you're just grabbing all the good food. So one remains hungry and another gets drunk. They were, no. This part really has confronted me on, um, we serve grape juice and not wine. They were serving real wine and not grape juice. Because what they were doing is they were drinking way too much. They were taking it from everybody else and drinking the wine. And so but we follow a principle elsewhere that God gave us, that we are to give none offense neither to the Jew nor the Gentile nor to the church of God. Why would I ever want to put wine in the cup when there's somebody in the congregation who might be, a congregation this size I'm sure is, a former alcoholic. Why would I put a temptation before them? So we always agree. But they were going and eating all the food and taking all the wine so the people at the end of the line, as they were, and we did it, dismissed by tables, when they were in the line, there was nothing left for them. And he's saying, where in the world is the principle of Christian love? Jesus gave his life for us and you can't even leave some food for them? Are you kidding me? You're messed up. You're messing up the Lord's Supper. You're missing the whole point. He says, 
Don't you have homes to eat or drink it? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? Oh, you see, in the body of Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's neither bond nor free. Uh, there's neither male nor female. We are all one in Christ. We're all one in Christ. What shall I say? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. What he's been saying is, you need to really look here at what you're doing. The next part of his direction is, now I want you to look back. He says, for I have received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord on the night in which he is betrayed. Okay, so he says, now go back with me, all right, in time, it's the original Passover, and the Lord on the night in which Judas betrayed him. Now, I, I always wonder why he picked this out of everything that went on that night. He could have said, hey, do you remember the night I told you you got to love one another? Or he could have said, hey, do you remember the night that I told Peter he's going to deny me three times? <laughs> he could have said, hey, remember when I... And he could have just picked it. Remember the night in which I washed your feet? Out of all the things, he says, on the night in which... He was betrayed. I think there's something there. Do we actually betray him at the table? I think that's what he's digging. Remember the night in which Judas was, was out there betraying Jesus, uh, Jesus while we were all celebrating Lord's Supper? Jesus on that night, he took the bread and when he Eucharist, there's a word, he gave thanks. Jesus gave thanks, he blessed it, he broke it. Now, you, you broke that bread, you didn't really, you know, bread that we have is all leavened, and so it uh, got yeast in it, rises, and you don't really break it, you kind of tear it, you know? But when it's uh, done without leaven, it's more like a cracker, and it does break. <laughs> when he broke it, he said, this is my body, which is for you. Here's where we can come up with some pretty harebrained notions about what communion is. Some believe that when Jesus, when you take that bread and you partake of it, it actually becomes the flesh of Jesus in your mouth and in your body. I don't think that's what Texas is teaching at all. There's some that say, well, that it must just be there mystically. Somehow it's just mystically present with it. I don't think that's what Texas is talking at all. When he says this is, the is is kind of like represents. This represents my body. It's an object lesson. Jesus often used the being verb for himself. Remember when he said, I am the light of the world. He did not turn into an ever-ready flashlight. <laughs> he didn't turn into that. I'll tell you right now. When he said, I am the door. He wasn't a block of wood swinging on hinges. When he said, I am the way. He didn't turn into a dirt path. and he didn't, You didn't trample on him. Everyone is a metaphor. And the metaphor is really saying, I represent the light. I represent the path. I represent the door. I represent this, this, this bread. It represents me. This is my body. And what was he going to do with his body? He was going to go out to the cross and he was going to suffer and die. And he was going to bleed. And he was going to pour out his blood. And he says, this is my body, which is, and here's the key word, for you. The word for is a substitutionary term. I did it for you. Years ago, I was just a teenager and I was going to a Halloween party that my brother was having uh, at his home and for the family and I told my folks that I couldn't make it and, but then I was going to crash the party so they wouldn't know who I was. And so my, my girlfriend and I, we got sheets, white sheets and we dyed them orange inside the, 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 the washing machine and then we stitched them up around the top of the ring and around the bottom and, and we wore boots and, and then we put, we grabbed my mom's, she was a, she was a, a baker and she baked wedding cakes, we grabbed one of her box, actually two of them, and, and we spray painted them green and put two holes in them, put them over our head, that was the stem and we went as a pumpkin, two pumpkins. We stuffed that thing with newspapers, you know, and we stuffed it and it, it really worked pretty well. And so, but my mom saw the boxes painted all green 
My mom went ballistic. I mean, you would have thought we stole all her jewelry. I mean, <laughs> these, were, these were her boxes for transporting wedding cakes. And uh, so I knew she was really hot, and I was in big trouble. So I went to my brother Dave, and I said, Dave, this is what I'm doing. I'm going to crash the Halloween party tonight, so I can't let her know I did it. you got to say you did it. <laughs> So my brother goes into the house and he said, who painted those boxes green? And there's my brother. Well, I did it. Whoa, she lit into him. And I'm standing outside saying, ooh, ooh, ouch, that's hurting. <laughs> Poor David. So then we go to the party. I go to the party and they can't figure it out who we are. And all of a sudden my mom realizes those boxes are her wedding, bo wedding cake boxes on top of our heads. And she comes over and she looks inside the Dennis. <laughs> oh man, this was like worse than stealing the cup of the Lord, you know? <laughs> so, my whole point here is my brother took the rap for me. And when I take that bread, I remember that Jesus died for my sins. He paid me so that I never, ever have to pay for it. He says, do this in remembrance of me. There's no hocus pocus going on here when we have the Lord's Supper. This is all about remembering. It's a memorial service. We remember. Jesus said, I don't want you to forget what I have done for you. So use this object lesson to remember what I've done for you. Likewise. In the same manner, after supper, he took the cup. Took the cup. This is the cup. This cup is the new covenant. Now, the new covenant means there was an old covenant, and the old covenant was the law, and under the old covenant, it could not save you. It could only condemn you. There is not one single law that could save you. Not one. Every single law, if you broke it, all 613, I know most of you are only familiar with the ten. There's 613 commandments in the Torah. And if you, if you break any one of them, you are subject to death. The wages of sin is death. So we needed a new covenant to fix the problem of the old covenant. And the new covenant was ratified with the blood of Jesus Christ. Because he says this cup represents the new covenant, not the blood. He says, this cup represents the new covenant of everlasting life, forgiveness of sin, pardon, justification, all that comes with the fact that it was in his blood that he poured out on the cross. For without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. It's all wrapped up in that. He says, I want you to remember, I shed my blood for you to give you eternal life. And this is what he says. Do this in remembrance of me. It's all a memorial. It's all, all remembrance. All I remember. He then turns and he says, now I want to look ahead. He says, first of all, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Every time we do this, we are reasserting, ah, Jesus died on the cross for my sin. I have him as my Savior. I am, I am the one who has the righteousness of Christ imputed to him because he died for me. I stand before God accepted. He wants me to remember, remember that. But notice this, it says, until he comes. We talked last week about how Jesus left the earth, not too far from Bethany, not Bethany the church, <laughs> but Bethany the location that was on the, the hills of Mount of Olives, and, and Jesus left from Mount of Olives, that, but he said he's going to come back in the same manner as he goes. I'm going to tell you something right now. We will not celebrate the Lord's Supper in heaven because the text tells us we do it to remember him. We won't need to remember him in heaven. We have direct access to him. We only do the Lord's Supper here on earth. Hmm. Isn't that great? This is something I can only do in this lifetime. I'll not do later. So if I might as well do it, better do it now. All right? He then says, look out. He says, therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. He's saying, look out. Watch how you do this. Listen, we're all unworthy of the Lord's Cup. Every single one of us. But he's not talking about our personal worth here because in Christ, we are worth 
all to God. He, he sacrificed his son for us. Without him, he says, listen, it's not about my worth. It's about the fashion in which I take of the element. And he says, whoever eats his bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of our Lord. So what is this unworthy manner? I want to suggest it's divisions in the church. If you've got a grudge against somebody else in the church, you need to fix that and come and partake of the Lord's Supper. I want to suggest also that the early division issue was baptism. You go to the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, and they were divided. You know where they were divided? They had a little ego trip over who baptized them. Oh, I was baptized by Peter. Oh, I'd gotten baptized. They picked one of the other disciples. And, oh, I got baptized by Paul. I got baptized by, by Christ. I got... And it's not about who baptized you. It's about the one whose name you got baptized in. Why would you think that your baptism is better because you got it done in the Jordan while you're on a trip to Israel than in the tank that's right back here? It's not, it's not about the right. It's all about the Christ. The Christ. They were getting all divided over there. They were divided over carnality. They, they, they were, you know what carnal means? You, you, you know the word carnival. That's why I got it up there. I had a professor say, Carnality is when you give your flesh a fling. Because <laughs> the word means flesh. You go to a carnival, you get on those exhilarating rides, right? My favorite is the dragster at Cedar Point. It only lasts about nine seconds. You wait for an hour in line for a nine-second thrill. But every time you ride it, it's less exhilarating. Because you've been there, done that before. Carnality is when you give your flesh a fling with the world. And he's telling them, by now, you should be teachers, and instead, you are carnal babies in Jesus. You need to grow up. It's disrespecting the minister. <laughs> Imagine that. Well, it wasn't the pastor in that text. It was actually the apostles, okay? You disrespect the apostles? causing division in the church. It's when there's sexual immorality. There was a man that was taken his father's wife. It's incest. You go a little bit further, he says, they were having lawsuits against each other in the church. He says, what's wrong with you? Isn't there anybody in your church smart enough to serve as judge and figure out how to solve your problem? Why would you take your matters to the world he says, there shouldn't be these lawsuits. He goes on and says, why don't you just suffer wrong? Hmm. Who modeled that for us? Uh, Jesus. He took all that wrong. He said, and you're a Christian? A little Christ? You can't suffer a little, a little wrong? You always got to be right. He says, that divides the church. You, you go a little bit further, and he talks about fornication and adultery. And the, I could go on and on through the book of Corinthians because the church was a real, real church of real people who had real problems. And, but the bottom line is this. The way you take an unworthy manner is while you're living with unconfessed sin in your life and you have an unrepentant heart or spirit, you don't plan to change. And you come and you partake of the element. The Bible says, though, if we would just confess our sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Wow. That's why when we have a time here, we're going to talk about a self-examination time. You look and you say, Lord, show me what's in my heart that I need to confess to you or what I need to fix in relationships with others so that I can take of this in a worthy way. Then there's a warning. Warning, warning, <laughs> Will Robinson. Warning, warning. Some of you older people know what that means. <laughs> Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. That is a dire warning. It's saying as if you were right there at the cross, pounding the nails in his hands and his feet, 
and you are the one thrusting the, the spear in his side, he says, you will be guilty of the body and the blood of Christ. Wow. So what you've got to do to fix that, confess your sins, but to do that, a man ought to examine himself. Hmm. Here at Bethany, we practice open communion. Open communion means it's open to everyone. You don't want to know why? I am not your judge. I am not your judge. You are never going to give an account for what you've done in life to me. You're not. You're going to give an account to God. And so God doesn't say, hey, have the pastor examine you. No, 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 no. He says, a man, every man, ought to examine himself. That, that every individual's got to look inside. You've got to look into the mirror. And the Bible tells us the mirror is the word. You look into the, the, the perfect law of liberty, the word of God, it's a mirror. A man ought to examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks the cup. It's not an afterthought, it's a beforethought. Lord, show me how I'm not in line with your word so I confess and get this matter straightened out before you. That's what we're doing before the Lord's cup. He says... Otherwise, we have the self-infliction of judgment. If anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of, of the Lord, he eats and drinks judgment on himself. Judgment simply means to decide between what is right and wrong. That's all it means, judgment. Condemnation is, oh, now you're pronounced guilty because we decided you really messed up. <laughs> He said, you've got to do some judgment of yourself. Otherwise, if you don't make this judgment, you're going to inflict upon yourself some real pain. And this is what he says. Just look around. Look around. That's why many among you, he said, look around among you. Just look around. All right, I'm moving here somewhere. I've got to stop moving. You know, that's really hard for me. I don't think it's that piece. Sorry. That's why many among you are, here he goes, weak and sick. Whoa. Weak and sick. Abusing the Lord's table by not coming in a worthy fashion might lead to being weak and sick. From other passages of Scripture, I come to the conclusion it's like this. I first have, first have a guilty conscience. You know what that is? I do. That's that feeling that about that burning in my pocket. <laughs> I feel guilty that I stole. I feel guilty that I had an affair. I feel guilty that I got drunk. I feel guilty. Whatever it is, I feel guilty. I feel guilty. Because the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. I knew that I sinned. I knew that the right thing to do was to let them keep that little cup in the tray. And then of judgment, oh, I'm going to have to face the music with mom. Because <laughs> she's going to find out. She always does. So it begins with that guilt, and then it can lead to circumstances. Circumstances in your life just all of a sudden aren't going right, and you know why they're not going right. Because this thing, the Holy Spirit, is convicting you that this thing that you've done or you have or what... Is, is, is the cause. My case in point is Jonah. Jonah knew that he was running from the Lord and the Lord chastened Jonah until he finally got back on the right track. He changed the circumstance. Storm at sea, the lot. They pulled straws. It fell on him. He knew every, everything, was, everything in the circumstances in his life were going in a direction. You really need to get back in track, on track with God. That's all happened. He says, that's why many among you are weak and sick is the next one. Sometimes he inflicts weakness and sickness. Now, not all weakness and sickness is related to disobedience. The apostle Paul was pleading with the Lord, take this from me, the sickness, or you know, his thorn in the flesh. And he, three times and every time God just said, no, no, I gave that to you so that you don't get too puffed up and proud. He said, that thorn in the flesh, he said, I, I did that to keep you humble. Sometimes we have events and circumstances and sickness for other reasons. I never know why. You know who knows? You. God. That's who knows. That's who knows. He then says, and a number of you have fallen asleep. You have just resisted 
the conviction, the circumstances, the, the illness, and you've just, and, and he says, oh, some of you have just fallen. That's a euphemism. You've, they've died. They've died in Jesus. And, and this is what he says. But if we would judge ourselves, we would discern, we would look into our own lives and, and decide, is this right or is this wrong in my life? He said, we would not come under judgment. And that word is condemnation. No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Never condemned. Never condemned. When we are judged by the Lord, we are, not, we are being disciplined. There's no wrath. All my wrath was taken on the, on the cross. I'm never going to go to hell and suffer for my sins. None of that. Because Jesus took it all. He says, so we are disciplined. And the word disciplined is the word child train. See that paddle there? I got one that looks similar to it at home. It was always right next to the breadboard. Is that what you call that? Bread box. The board was always next to the bread box. And later in life, I don't think my sister was involved in this, whenever we get spankings, we didn't sign our name on it. <laughs> my name is on the board. A little spanking here and there, you know. Sometimes we get real cute and hide the board. That really didn't work out well. <laughs> no. What he says here is, when you're judged of the Lord, whether with conviction, sick, whatever, whatever you, whenever you judge the Lord, you're being disciplined. He's treating you as his own child, and everyone who's a child gets disciplined. When I was a, had my kids at home, and we go to the grocery store, and they'd misbehave, I'd, I'd put them in line, I'd discipline them. The mother kid would be misbehaving, and my dad would say, Dad, that kid needs a good spanking. But I didn't do it wasn't my kid. But when you're a child of God, he says, you no longer get judgment, condemnation. You get child training, discipline, put you right, back on the right path so that you'll be a full, mature believer in Christ. He says, so that we will not be condemned with the world. There's our word condemnation. We are never condemned because Jesus took it all on the cross. He says, then look out. So then, my brothers, when you come together, this lookout is like, look out for other people. Don't take two pieces of the chick of denial at the love feast. Leave one for someone else. Look out for others. If anyone is hungry, you should eat at home so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment, condemnation. When I come, I will give you further instruction on this. Wow. I want to tell you one last very familiar story. I've told this story here so many times. Some of you could probably tell it better than me. I have three sons. And my oldest son's name is David. His name means beloved. And I would tell my son he's beloved. I love you, David. I love you. You are my beloved. One day he did something that was wrong and really upset me. And I raised my voice and was about to tell him he was going to meet the paddle. <laughs> you know how that goes? I mean, I do. And he was so remorseful and sorrowful. He was just crying and bawling. And, 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 and he said, Dad, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, and he sniffed it all. You know how you did kids do. And then he said, Dad, and then after all, I am your beloved. <laughs> Something happened at that moment to all that disappointment in my life. He reminded me who he was. You see, when I sin as a Christian, I don't lose my salvation. Every bit of my sin was taken on the cross. I'm saved eternally. Eternally. I have eternal life. But like Peter when, when was told by Jesus... Or Jesus told Peter when, when and Peter was having a, the, the feet washing going on, he said, don't wash my feet. And Jesus said, if I, if I don't wash your feet, then you have no part with me. And he said, oh, then wash all of me. He said, no, the whole thing doesn't need washing, just your feet. And he washed his feet. Listen, when I got saved, I got totally saved, all, all saved. But when I sin, I break fellowship, communion, closeness. Just like my son David, when he did that offense, 
It broke it with me. But when he confessed, when he confessed, I did it wrong. God, Dad, I'm your beloved. When I say, Lord Jesus, I messed up. I messed up. I didn't have to get saved all over again. I didn't kick my son out of the family. God doesn't kick me out of it. He says, you, you, you don't need to be all cleansed everywhere. You, just, you, got a little, you got a little bit of thing here that's causing a, a division in, in our relationship. You need to take care of that. You need to confess that. And in some cases, you need to fix it. You need to repair that with someone. You need to go deal with them. And he says, but, but I... I, I take a cleanse. If we will confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. Powerful. That's my last little story. We're going to pray and ask God's blessing upon these elements and we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper. Father in heaven, your word is powerful. It's instructive. It's heartwarming to think that you put this in place so that we would deal with those things that have come between us. And we can go out of this place having full fellowship, thankful, having partaken of the Lord's Supper to remember you and to remember what you've done for us, that we're your children. Bless these elements to us. In Jesus' name, amen.